Yeah, it's dope. Welcome back to another episode of Marvel News Desk, your best place to keep up with all the latest news reviews and speculation concerning Marvel film and TV shows. Today we have our usual panel. We've got Adam. Hey, what's going on, guys? You can find me on Twitter at Adam Barnhart. And we've got Rhiannon. Hey, guys, you can find me on Twitter. I go under a pseudonym of Brooklyn Wallace, and my handle is at Shada Patron. And I'm Caleb. I'm at Caleb A. Borchers. Uh, we want to encourage you guys to subscribe to us on YouTube at Marvel News De- watch.marvelnewsdesk.com. Also, you can check out the second podcast in the Marvel News Desk family, which is AP Marvel. And this week, they're going to talk about something which I did not look up ahead of time, so it'll be a surprise, but it won't be a surprise by the time this podcast is released. I'm sure you can go find it and uh, and see. So, uh, yeah. Also, um, if you've been watching the YouTube channel, uh, we should have some more uh, content for our Patreon people next week for The Gifted, and then that'll hit a few days before The Gifted premieres on Fox. Um, also, uh, we've been loading up the podcast to YouTube. If you prefer to watch slash listen that way, uh, it's just an image and the audio file, pretty easy breezy. But, uh, if you're one of those kind of people that likes that, that'd be great. So, um, Adam, man, you're in a new place. Are you enjoying the, uh, the new digs? It's all right. It's uh, a lot better than that apartment living. That's for sure. I had totally meant to, uh, if you can kind of see back there, can you pick that up? That's supposed to be a bookshelf that I'm going to like deck out with some of my first appearance comics and stuff. That's a nice little uh, backdrop for the pod. Uh, but I, like I told you, I totally forgot that we are podcasting tonight. So I didn't have time to do it. And you sound a little different. Like that room has some different acoustics and all. So, Yeah, is it too echoey or something? I tried doing a, a test with the microphone and it was initially kind of bad, but I think I got it figured out. Yeah, I think I think it'll be fine. I mean, we'll see what the audio sounds like, but different rooms are different. Like the last two weeks I recorded in my living room and so it had a different sound than when I record in one of the other rooms in the house because they're smaller and... You know, you I, I have more and more of appreciation of like professional sound studios now that we do this podcast than ever, because like it really does make a difference. Like I become much more of a sound snob as time's gone on. It probably doesn't help that this house has not a single patch of carpet anywhere. Yep. Echo, echo, echo. Now I need to have sound panels and stuff. That's good. Actually, that's really interesting. So this room that's quieter that I record in um, has carpet. And the other room doesn't, so that makes sense. All right, for those four listeners that have not turned off the podcast already, <laughs> let's jump into our news. Uh, this week, we got a hint. Uh, Rhiannon, you'll have to remind me, was it Netflix in the Philippines or Singapore or where was it? Thailand. Thailand. That, uh, apparently accidentally posted that Daredevil is hitting on September 12th, and so... No, October October, October 19th. October, October 19th. 19th. Today's September 12th. <laughs> October 19th. <laughs> All right, my bad. All right, so yes. Would you like to start over? <laughs> <laughs> no, it'll be funnier this way. So October 19th is apparently the day we're getting it, which is two weeks after Comic-Con. Is that right? Uh, ish. Like, calendars are so hard to find. Um... So, yeah, that's two weeks after Comic-Con. And that's a solid week after the press embargo. All right. Um, I mean, obviously, we've maybe seen a little bit of this, but uh, is it... I mean, I assume that you guys are excited that it's coming this quickly, right on the heels of Iron Fist. We don't have to wait forever for another show. Yeah, I'm really excited that... Um, th- yeah, I mean, give it to me now. Give it all to me right now. So earlier the better. For the record, Michael T. Ford has already dubbed it Murdochtober. Murdochtober. I get it. Like October, yeah. The different emphasis on a different syllable and it it, it works. <laughs> Caleb <laughs> <laughs> you, you are sharp this evening, I, Caleb. I <laughs> Murdochtober. I do love that yeah. we I mean, I like that we're getting it. I remember 
I don't know, it was a couple of years ago when Luke Cage came out after Daredevil 2. And we're like, oh, they could give us Luke Cage in the summer and then Iron Fist in the fall. And then, like, the the date came out and they're like, coming in September. And we're like, what? That's another, you know, like, it felt like they were so far apart. And so it's kind of nice that we've now gotten into this rhythm where these are coming more frequently. Um, particularly because it seems like they're starting to get better again. So, all right, I promise that was the most exciting piece of news we have. This is a very slow news. It's all downhill from there. So um, this is, I don't know what to think about this. There are rumors now that Marvel is working with Guy Ritchie on a Captain Britain and Black Knight movie. Uh, Adam, I'm going to start with you since uh, my guess is that Rhiannon does not have a deep love of Captain Britain, but maybe I could be wrong. And you think I do or what? Yeah, I think something with the uh, Black Knight could be uh, interesting, you know, like Dane Whitman and stuff. He's an Avenger. Um, And there was apparently uh, an Ebony Blade reference in Doctor Strange that got cut that was in a deleted scene or something. So it's not like they haven't... They, it's not like they haven't been thinking about Black Knight in the MCU. I, I guess I was under the assumption that Captain Britain was a Fox character. Um, so it does seem kind of odd that they would be thinking about this stuff now if they come with the same mindset that they're not thinking about any X-Men or Fantastic Four stuff, if that makes sense. Because isn't Jamie Braddock, uh, I think he's an X-Men character, or he's related to an X-Men, I don't know. Comic books, who knows. But, yeah, I mean, Guy Ritchie? I I don't know. I don't even know who reported that. It wasn't that hashtag show, was it? It was a different site? No, it was like comicbookrumors.twitter feed. Oh, okay, yeah. So it's probably not um, news. But, the, I mean, this rumor's been around a while. I mean, I remember two, three years ago when we were at MCU Exchange, there was this rumor that a Captain Britain script was circulating for a TV show. Um, but it being Fox would make so much more sense. If there's just a random crazy Marvel movie being filmed with no notice, it being a Fox property would make... So much more sense that somebody, you know, some executive on the way out is like, yeah, yeah, and that's greenlit. Like, how about it, Guy Ritchie? Um, And if this does come together, I mean, our guy Michael T. Ford has the perfect fan casting for one uh, Captain Britain, I think. A freshly available actor by the name of Henry Cavill. I think that's what he said. He tweeted me something. I can't remember. I think he said... Am I saying that right? It's Henry Cavill, right? I don't care enough about Superman. Yeah. Imagine Cavill as Captain Britain and Christian Bale as the Black Knight. So this is a little spoilery. This is a little spoiler even for me. So if you're a listener who does not want to hear this, go ahead. Uh, I think that you guys both know about this. Uh, recently, John Slattery was seen on set of Avengers 4. Um, this is the part where I can talk about a news story that I hate this week. The article I saw said, John Slattery appears in Avengers 4 with spoiler. And I'm like, well, I think we know who he's going to appear with. It's not like, you know, the guy who played Howard Stark is going to show up and have a scene with Mantis, you know, or like... You know, I mean, maybe with Bucky, but it's probably with, you know, Tony Stark. There's not a whole lot of spoiler to me that's saved by that title. I was about to say, is Tony Stark being in Avengers 4 a spoiler? Because No, they didn't survived. want to tell you which Avenger he was he was talking to. But what Avenger would he be talking to? Well, I mean, it would be a spoiler if he was, like, talking to Black Widow or something. I guess so, yeah secret love scene between Nebula and Howard yeah. Stark coming yeah. to Avengers 4. That would be the real... Caleb's been <laughs> reading some fanfic on Tumblr, apparently. Um, do you guys like the idea of Tony getting one last chance to talk to dear old dad? 
I mean, he got it in uh, Civil War. I mean, this is barf stuff, right? Well, I mean, that's the thing is, I don't know if it's barf stuff or if it's time travel, right? Like, we don't know. I guess they both will have a similar emotional resonance. Do you have any other thoughts there, Adam? Or <laughs> No, no, I just wanted to say barf. I mean, I think it'd be a lot more poignant if Tony actually traveled back in time to talk to his father other than speaking with his father through barf. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's interesting. Can barf, like, does barf have AI to try to, like, like, when you're in barf, can the characters say new things or say things that, like, would be anticipated? Like, do you see that Black Mirror episode where, like, they made robots that uh, could replace your dead loved one? And they would use all their social media posts and all their videos and stuff to like yeah. make it so they would so the robot says what you, your significant other would probably say. Like I don't know if Barf works that way or if it's just purely a memory, you know. Good questions. We need to invite a Barf expert on the pod. If you no, I'm not gonna. Say, I was about to say, let us know if you're a Barf expert. But we get all kinds of weirdos coming out of the woodworks. <laughs> Yeah, if you know about Barf, slide in our DMs at Marvel News Dad. At Adam Barnhart. I was about to say at, at. Hey, my DMs are open now. My DMs have been lit all week. Have they? Oh, yeah. We'll talk about Adam's fight picking a little bit later. Um, another sign that I'm really desperately trying to find news. Uh, we got uh, some interviews this week that were kind of random, that were uh, Marvel people talking about things they would like to have happen. So uh, we'll play a game of Would You Rather. Mark Ruffalo uh, has said that he uh, has this kind of dream where he would love Hulk and Banner to face off in like a psych battle. I guess kind of like Legion um, in the psychic plane or something like that uh, to see who's in control, whether it's Banner or Hulk. Uh, On other news, um, Kate Blanchett said that she would like to see Hela come back to team up with Thanos. Uh, between those two, which of those sounds more exciting to you, Rhiannon? I mean, I feel like the Hulk, I feel like Hulk's psychic plane wouldn't be that interesting. It would just be like all Hulk smash and Banner's psychic plane would be all, I'm going to try to science my way out of this. And, uh, Hella Thanos would be pretty awesome. So I'm going to go with Hella Thanos. Okay, let me, uh, pose a question about this. Does the... Um, Bruce Banner Hulk fight in the psychic plane include a dance number? I, I think he was uh, thinking that like Banner would like come up with weapons with his mind or something. It was very, very uh, odd. Ruffalo was very much going into left field with this. Okay, because I was going to say if Banner and Hulk have a dance off, then I'd for sure go with that. But if there's not a dance-off involved for possession of the body, I would suppose it, it'd be uh, it'd be nice to see Hela and Thanos team up. Kind of that that comet comet comic accurate representation of Thanos and death. It would make the internet happy. It does make me laugh how in the lead up to that movie, a lot of us were like, "Oh, oh, I totally see what Feige's doing." They're setting up Hela to be a substitute for death, and then she'll be the thing that... And then the Russo brothers are like, no, we're not doing that at all. Like, that is totally in fanboys' minds. And that really does talk about our main conversation, which we'll get to in a minute, so... Our main conversation is about fanboys. Um, Even more desperate for news, let's talk about Dark Phoenix reshoots. (laughs) So, apparently... (laughs) um, that girl from Game of Thrones that plays Jean Grey, who I can't remember her name, and um, the woman who's not Bryce Dallas Howard are uh, in a scene together. Who is what's her name? Jessica, uh, Chastain. Jessica Chastain. Yes, uh, Chastain and Jean Grey were in a scene with mocap suits today. Uh, is Chastain going to be a scroll? Is that what we heard? Sure, I can't remember. What was I mean? Wait, Dark Phoenix is shooting? I thought that was canceled. <laughs> no, okay. No, apparently Bummer. they're shooting it a second time in the hope that it'll come out better. No, this I thought time. I. Uh, I'm pretty sure I saw something where they said scrolls would not be involved. 
So then maybe there were thoughts about Chastain being like Lilandra, 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 Lilandra. I don't know. I'm not an expert. It looks like a Welsh word, the double yeah. L's, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I don't know, because we thought it was Lilandra, and then we heard that they were doing scrolls, and so that would be interesting if they reverted back. It would seem like they've lost they've lost the race to the scroll photo, right? Like, now we have seen the scrolls in those Captain Marvel photos, and so they're the second scrolls now, even though their movie's going to come out beforehand. I don't know, I just hope they don't, like, butcher the Shi'ar Imperial Guard on this Dark Phoenix movie. Especially when it's so close to being in the MCU. That's my only hope. Please don't make me pretend I have thoughts on this. <laughs> it's fine. I'm always <laughs> I'm always torn, Rhiannon, because I never want to come off as a jerk like, well, Rhiannon's not going to know no, about this. No. But then there's some times where I'm pretty sure that you're not going to be into it. <laughs> I was just like digging through our news. I was like, is there a link about this? Can I pretend and come up with thoughts? It is. I really do hope they pulled out the scrolls because it's going to be crazy confusing to America if they see two movies with scrolls come out within like what three weeks of each other. I think with those release dates now. So, um, I wonder if the reshoots are when Marvel made the purchase. They sent over a memo that was like, "We don't care. Change it to the Badoon. You know, make them uh, whatever. Just don't make them scrolls." So. It's hard to imagine. I'm still not sold on the MCU version of Scrolls, so I, it's hard for me to believe that the Fox version of Scrolls would be any better than Triton. Disney has started a push for Black Panther at the Oscars. They have a uh, they put up like a page for about Oscar consideration. They I think are going to try to push Black Panther in every category of the Oscars. Which makes sense. A lot of the technical stuff would be stuff they would do. The costume design, I think, would be worthy. Um, dude, Kendrick Lamar performing at the Oscars is something that I'm looking forward to. Um, in fact, there's kind of a couple songs. I think they could do the Weekend song and the... Um, oh, what was the other one? There's there's two. There's the one with the Weekend, and there's... Um, the uh, other one that I can't think of. Anyway, um, if you guys had to bet right now, yes or no, uh, with the Oscar category for popular film not happening, I don't think we talked about that last week. That's got scrapped. Oh, yeah, they okay. got so much that. criticism they gave up. So it's best picture or nothing. If you had to guess right now, will it be nominated for best picture? Nominated, yes. Yeah. I'd agree with nominated. Because I'm trying to... Is there any... Is, was Dark Knight nominated for Best Picture? I know Ledger won for... Yeah, Ledger won actor, is. It would seem like a pretty big deal for a comic book movie to get in there, but by getting rid of the popular movie category, I feel like they've almost shoehorned themselves where it will be very embarrassing to the Academy if this is not nominated, I would think. Ooh, it was nominated in a lot of uh, categories. Sound editing, cinematography, visual effects, production design, film editing, sound mixing, and makeup. Not best picture, though. Oh. I mean, if you're an Academy member, you kind of feel like you have to vote for it at this point, don't you? Or else... I mean, really. I mean, like, why else would they have gotten rid of the popular movie category? I mean, Black Panther was what everybody kept saying when they said they were going to do the, the the popular movie category. So you have to nominate it as best picture now. They were trying to create a whole category just for this movie. Now it now it like kind of huh. But I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I don't know. I think that they just got so much backlash or just like backpedaling completely and saying, "Uh, eh, we tried to give it an award, but I mean, it would. The most popular film was clearly like for genre films, right? I mean, Probably, it, yeah. it was for the big blockbusters and not the those. I mean, maybe they thought they were doing it for Infinity War. Maybe they thought Infinity War needed a category, but I think it has to get nominated, or else everybody's racist. <laughs> well, no, I mean, I think. Hashtag not my Oscars. 
you, you, you brought it up, Rhiannon. and I wasn't sure if I wanted to, but there is a, to try to talk about this the best way I know how, this is arguably the most culturally significant movie to ever be made by predominantly African American filmmakers, right? When you look at the fact that it's directed, written, and starred by all, I mean, with all due respect to like a Moonlight that did win a Best Picture, that is not a movie that had the kind of cultural impact this, I mean, people have compared Black Panther to Star Wars as far as like what it will do generationally as far as film. And so... Don't giggle, that was me! (laughs) That was Rhiannon. So, I mean, (laughs) I'm just saying like... If the Oscars really do want to not appear racist, which after a couple of years ago with the Oscars so white controversy they're trying to do, it's going to be really hard to say, oh, look, the most significant movie to come out of primarily African-American creative people in a, ever, and pff, it's not worth the best picture. Like It would seem like there would be some pressure there for them to nominate it. I think it will get nominated. I think it won't win. I think it'll be one of those situations where it wins five million other Oscars, you know, maybe even best director, best cinematography, you know, they, they, I, they win all of the little BS side categories and then lose the one big one. I hope that's not the case, but I can totally see that happening. To some silly independent movie that features a sex scene between a dude and a mermaid or vice versa. That is literally all I know about that movie. Yeah, I mean, that being said, people always talk about Oscars hate genre movies. That was a genre movie that won Best Picture, right? I mean, that is a sci... It's weird, but it's like, it is a sci-fi kind of movie. And so maybe things are changing over at the Academy. But I mean, when's, when's the last time a huge, huge, huge... I mean, Lord of the Rings, right? That's probably the lone absolutely enormous blockbuster movie that won best picture right uh gladiator gladiator came to mind immediately i think we went through this last week avatar titanic avatar did not win best picture oh avatar did not we got uh we got corrected on that last time wow Thank you, whoever corrected us. That's what we get for not. Going I think it was on. Michael T. Ford, and it was we weren't even done recording the podcast. He's like, "No, guys, that's not right." I mean, you're right, Adam. Lord of the Rings: Return of the King was the last, I think, major box office. Gladiator was in 2000 was a um, was a big box office movie. Um, How did Chicago win? Titanic <laughs> won. Uh, Braveheart. So there was kind of this period. If you go through the 90s, Titanic, Braveheart, Forrest Gump, Schindler's List, Silence of the Lambs, Dance with Wolves. I mean, these were all relatively successful commercial movies. The 90s were fantastic. I mean, look at these movies. They were fantastic. I mean, I mean, I don't mean like fantastic, like Oscar. I mean, they were best pictures, but like those are movies that you've seen. And, I mean, technically, Avatar kind of did win an Oscar if Dances with Wolves won, right? Because isn't Av- I mean, right? <laughs> Vicariously. <Yeah. laughs> uh, Hurt Locker, by the way, is the film that beat uh, Avatar. Yeah, not the '90s, evidently, when they took the movies that should have won Best Picture and gave them Best Pictures. I'm still sore over Titanic beating L.A. Confidential, but that's probably a topic for another time. (laughs) That's when commercial films had too much troll. Okay, so I'm not sure. (laughs) Let's let's move on. Uh, The other thing I had in the news, Anna Taylor-Joy, who is in New Mutants, says that in the reshoots they are making the movie that they intended to make. I don't think anybody knows what they intended to make or what they intended in the second place to make or in the third place. It is shocking to me. They're still making that movie, but that's news. So in the original shoots, did they go out and say the wrong lines and need to correct it? Hmm. All right, Rihanna, you were excited about earlier. Let's talk about, um, we got a daredevil teaser this week. Uh, it was very short. I think it was Matt, uh, saying a couple of lines, the most infamous being, I'd rather die as Daredevil than live as Matt Murdock. Do you have any thoughts that you can share with our listeners on that uh, teaser? No, no thoughts at all. 
Sorry. Um, Matt Murdock is dead. We have the black... We're back to the black outfit, you guys. Um, which we saw. I mean, there was that one little, like, leaked set photo. So we kind of knew that was coming. But um, now it's, like, confirmed. Black outfit in the show. Um, yeah. I guess there'll be a little bit of religion. A little bit of dead Matt Murdock. It was exciting. I liked it. I don't know what I can say. I'm afraid of saying too I much. I, I don't want the, Narber, the Marvel snipers. <laughs> I mean, I'll say... You've already gone too far. My doorbell just rang. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, Adam's name is on the NDA. Hey, I don't think why is, okay. there's a red right, dot it, on my chest? It. What? Um, I, I think I think it is safe to say, like, this this I felt that this teaser was incredibly appropriate and accurate for the tone and feel of the show. Yes, absolutely. Can we say that? <laughs> yeah, and that dialogue line, I think that line, I'd rather you know, I'd rather die as Daredevil than live as Matt Murdock. I think I may have said it early, wrong. Anyways, whatever, whatever the line is, I was about to say how memorable it is. That's silly, but I think it is great writing and it totally sets up just a fascinating exploration path for them with Matt in the season so and along with it they did some bible verses uh on twitter uh the daredevil account responded to 12 fans with verses uh Caleb did that have any meaning for you uh, the only one I saw was the job verse and it was not particularly meaningful by itself. And so I'd have to look at the other verses. That would be interesting. There were some Psalms. I mean, to me, they just like, they, they were good, like responses. Like one person was so excited and it was like, you know, peace will come with patience or, you know, be patient or whatever. But there was some speculation. I've seen some fan theories since it's a slow news week that they were hinting with the 12, that it's the 12 apostles and that somebody will betray him. And who in that case would be the Judas of daredevil. Yeah. I mean, that's fascinating in as much as there's people have talked about born again here and born again, obviously kicks off with a major betrayal, right? Yeah. So that's, it's an interesting theory, but I, I've always been a little disappointed actually by the use of scripture, by the daredevil Twitter feed. Cause they generally just find scriptures that have words in it that sound like daredevil words. And then they quote it. And I'm like, there's so many better things if put in the right context that could actually have deep meaning. And I think the the writers of the show do a lot of good homework on their theology, but not so much the Twitter account. That's what I'll say. I was about to say, do you want me to put you in touch with some of the writers so that you can... Oh, uh... dude, if they want a religion consultant, uh, I will <laughs> sign up any day for that job. I will pass the word. Now that the writers have revealed themselves on Twitter, I will pass the word. Yeah, Matt uh, Matt Murdock was so edgy in that teaser. I uh, accidentally mistook him for Batman for a second there. But outside of that, it does so edgy. Hashtag sad boy Matt. Asked Charlie what his soundtrack was. Probably Red Jumpsuit Apparatus or something. I don't know what any of those words actually yeah, meant. Adam. Cool for that. <laughs> Okay, that's... Like, you could just search it out. out search random it out. It's like a... Uh, no idea uh, about it. Yeah, sure. Uh, it was like a... No, it's like a middle school band. You know, when everyone did like their hair black and straight over an eye and wore skinny jeans and bought Hot Topic t-shirts? It's one of those kinds of bands. Edgy. Also, they probably watch Shadowhunters. All right, well, let's let's talk about the Netflix show we can talk about. Let's talk about Iron Fist uh, Season 2. We'll review, uh, at this point, the last four episodes. We've all seen them now, and we'll be full spoilers here. So if you've not finished that show, go ahead and do it um, before you listen to this. Uh, Adam, you are a very, very happy man. I know you've been holding this inside. 
Go ahead. Very happy. So happy. I am very happy. I'm incredibly happy. That was... And fight me on this. Fight me. Go ahead and fight me on this. This was probably one of the strongest endings for a Marvel show on Netflix. Um, Especially the last three episodes. Maybe The Punisher. Maybe Jessica Jones Season 1. But... Pound for pound, I'd take Iron Fist Season 2, the last three episodes, over anything else we've seen on Netflix in the MCU. I mean, I just thought it ended solid as hell. I mean, I understand where 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 people are coming from, where the last episodes didn't really make any sense, especially the last scene in particular. Um, but, I mean, they embraced, they went full on. I mean, they stopped just shy of the Doctor Strange like hex shields, but they still kind of went balls to the wall when it came with to the the mysticism, and that's something that the show should have. So why they didn't introduce it earlier in the season? They kind of did with the initial ritual, but then their eyes started glowing and they started making weird noises. You know, that's that's the kind of stuff the show should need. You know, I love the ending. Um, episodes 8, 9, and 10 are very, very good. Two thumbs up. Rhiannon, what did you think of, um, their decision to let Colleen become the Iron Fist? Was that, did you like that twist or not? I thought it was an interesting twist. I mean, I didn't see it coming. It changed things around. It, um, I mean, it was a roundabout way of sort of honoring all of those complaints. I mean, I I have to give them, like I joked at San Diego Comic-Con that they listened to everything, all of the criticisms of Iron Fist season one, they listened to all of those except for those that were racially charged. Um, I have to take that back because evidently they did, or they may have, um, they, uh, and I, I, I liked it. I mean, I think Colleen, I think it makes the Colleen Misty thing, you know, a, a even cooler option. The two of them, uh, it, it, it makes more, it gives more of an argument for them to have their own show. It, and it was just badass her fist turning white and lighting up her sword and you know her going at it and they did in the end show us where danny ends up so you know it's not like danny is completely you know going off writing poetry yeah i think that last scene's important in as much as if you did feel like danny was kind of getting written out of the show the last scene was like no he's still here and he's more iron fist than he's ever been you know, like he's got more power and capabilities than ever before. I think there is some truth to this. Is This was a bit reactionary, which isn't a problem for me. I think you had a show that got a lot of criticism for casting an actor that was doing some cultural appropriation and was kind of whiny and, um, and didn't really have a sense of purpose and didn't wasn't very good at martial arts and then so what you did is you boosted up the martial arts and then the twist you had was you give the iron fist to someone who is a you know Asian American actress no, and she's not American you make him she's not where's she from she's, she's British she's British. British I didn't know that okay so and is I mean she's not from Asia though is she a, what's the word for that Asian British anyways Asian a, an actor of Asian descent yes <laughs> and you put her in that role and also you make Danny self aware that scene at the end of episode eight where he said I'm out of control I don't know what I'm doing the fist messes me up you can be trusted with this and I can't because I don't know why I fight it was like. Wow, that was all the criticisms that everybody's leveled in the words of Danny Rand. And that self-awareness makes him so much more likable because he finally gets that he's kind of a spoiled little brat. 
And it was interesting to me that you had three people in about three episodes. Danny says it. And then Colleen later says, you don't know your purpose. You don't know what you're doing. And then Davos tells him, you don't have any purpose, Danny. And the idea that he's going to go off and like figure that out is so welcome to the character that he's going to be so much more enjoyable now that he has some self-awareness of what a lost little boy he is, you know? Right. So the, this is the thing I don't get. And you kind of said, said it earlier with the whole reactionary thing. I mean, what, what's the point of criticism? I mean, this was a big kind of topic on Twitter. People were criticizing the show for taking last season's criticisms in mind. You know, I mean, that I, I don't know why that just irks me so much. You know, I mean, shouldn't should they not pay attention to the criticisms and fix those? I think if it had been Scott Buck returning for season two, yeah, take what you did, own it, take it to that next level, go wherever you were going. But that's not what this was. This was them turning it over to an entirely new creative team. And that creative team i mean and that was for a reason so letting them go in a whole new direction made sense it strikes me it all depends on what the criticism is and where it comes from you know like for example i don't want star wars to knee-jerk react to the people who get all fussy about last jedi because i think it's a relatively small vocal group of people and i think there's a lot of people that feel differently Almost nobody liked Iron Fist season one. Like, Adam, you're an Iron Fist fan, and you still, like, it was almost like you were begrudgingly defending it, you know? Like, I just, you look at the way it was reviewed, if you're, if you're a show that gets a 10% on Rotten Tomatoes, or whatever the number was, then, yeah, you take criticism on board. And I think fixing those things isn't a problem. And I will say, some of the people... Not everybody, but some of the criticisms I've seen of Colleen taking on the powers of the fist are those jerkwads that talk about Last Jedi that just have their, you know, underwear all up in a bunch because how dare they let a female character have any significance? You know, it's like... I, I don't love the idea of just doing things just so that we have diversity, but I definitely hate the idea of not doing things to make sure we don't have diversity, you know, like giving the female minority character opportunities is something that is going to bring a certain kind of troll out. And I feel like I'm seeing that with iron fist and it's really disappointing. Yeah. And I mean, I am 95% sure that, uh, at some point in the comics, um, Colleen Wing does stuff with her chi at some sort. I'm not sure if she actually gets an Iron Fist of some stuff, but she does manipulate her chi in a sense to enhance her powers. So I, yeah, it's the internet, man. The internet. Follow me on Twitter and read about it all. Also, the idea, oh, the, this is this is stupid. Too many people have the fist powers. Have you read the comic books? I mean, the Immortal Iron Fist run has got Orson Randall and Danny Rand and Davos all running around with essentially the same power. Now, I, I forget the Steel Serpent. I think they have slightly different. It's not like he stole it from Danny. But, you know, like, there's people with this power. And suggesting that it's it's not com uh, we'll get to the comic accurate part in a minute um let's talk about where the series ends um because i think the amazing thing about this is i'm more excited for season three than i probably am of another netflix show like i want to see where this thing's gonna go i'm suddenly an iron fist fan due on like three minutes at the end of that episode um, Adam, do you want to walk us through a little bit like what we saw from a comic perspective? Because it really is faithful to some of the comics that you love best, I know. So the the last two episodes, there were two big moments, uh, scenes, I guess, in particular, that drew very heavily from 
Fraction and Brubaker and David Aha's Immortal Iron Fist run. And Caleb kind of pointed at this uh, last week by doing his kind of anthology part. Uh, the first big one was the Pirate Queen of, uh, what is it, Ping Hai Bay, I think it is. Um, her name was Wu Ao Shi. Uh, she was the first woman to have the Iron Fist powers. And, I mean, they it's pretty much one of Colleen's ancestors. So, you know, that's kind of adds another level to the whole argument with Colleen having powers. You know, I mean, if Colleen shouldn't have, why shouldn't Colleen have powers if her great, great, great grandma was the first female Iron Fist? Um, so there was that. There's a, there's an incredible one shot. I believe it's Immortal Iron Fist number seven. It's right around there where it focuses on the pirate queen. Um and it's awesome. She can focus her chi through arrows, and it's really gnarly. Read it. Um, that was episode 9, I think. Maybe it was episode 10. It was about the box. Danny found out the box was broken in the fight, and Danny saw the, the Iron Fist logo on the back of the seal. Um, and then the second one that actually made me stand out of my chair and say, holy shit, was when they name-dropped Orson Randall in the uh, Japanese bar or Asian bar, um, wherever they were. Um, and he he's very instrumental throughout the whole Immortal Iron Fist run. He was the Iron Fist just, he, he's Danny Rand's predecessor. Um, pretty much the same exact story as Danny. Uh, he got tired of being the protector of Kunlun, so he left. Um, and Orson Randall focused his chi through two guns, which we saw Danny use at the end. So that brings up several questions. Um... Apparently, the body Davos got, the Iron Fist corpse Davos got was stolen from Orson Randall's warehouse or what have you. Um, and Ward and Danny were trying to research information about this Orson Randall, but Danny already had the Chi Gun powers, which kind of hints that they had already met Orson Randall, I guess, if they're following comics, of course. Um, but yeah, I mean, as an Iron Fist fan, I have, my criticisms are completely pointless. You know, I, I'm ecstatic. I, I will, this is a hill I'll die on. Immortal Iron Fist is the best comic run of all time. So, I mean, to, to see them, okay, not the, the one of the best. It's my okay, favorite. That I can totally um, believe. I'm saying you're going through my head like, Watchmen, uh, the Dark Knight Returns, you know. <laughs> uh, Watch, Watchmen's kind of, uh, I don't know. It, I mean, it's it's a really, really solid run for some of us that were able to stay awake through it. Um, I flipped through it this week and tried uh, to decide if yeah, I had I more mean, interest. And I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean it's taking two of that that uh runs bigger moments, you know, that that was huge, which made me more confused when I saw that there was an uproar over Iron Fist fans not liking the show. Rian, did you have thoughts on those last couple minutes? What was that like as someone who's not as into the comic lore? Well, I have watched Winona Earp. Which I imagine you guys haven't. But Winona Earp, she is, she for reasons that are irrelevant to this podcast, she has a special gun and it turns yellow when she's about to fire it. And it looks a lot like Danny Rand. So I've been joking a lot about the Winona Earp crossovers um, and theorizing that all the blood on Matt Murdock in the or on Daredevil in the teaser is because he's a vampire now. And he has blood all over. Anyways. Um I liked it. It was exciting, it was surprising. I loved the Ward Danny. I mean the idea of Ward and Danny going out and having this, you know boys trip where they figure out all this stuff and that Ward is fully immersed in it and somehow he's won him over and he is no longer just some dude bro executive suit um 
I liked where it ended. I was interested. I mean, I had to have it explained to me. It made no sense to me. I knew it was something that made Adam just, like, pee his pants, but I didn't know why. I mean, I almost had a heart attack. Not sure that's pee. (laughs) 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 So... I, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, that's what, like, I didn't know what I was seeing, but it still seemed exciting to me. So, um, and, and it did, like, it did ease those, like, what now, now that Colleen has the Iron Fist, like, is Danny seriously just going to go to Tibet and write poetry? I was glad they gave us somewhere for him to go that had action and adventure. Let's, let's talk about that quick. How perfect was is the ward in Danny adventure I, I mean you think about it and ward is at the most perfect time to get up and leave his life behind to go on in this adventure right I, I, that's the part that gets me so excited because I think if they do it right this was kind of a flash forward and at least part of season three will be building up to how they got there in that bar in Japan and their relationship, the buddy cop show, uh, really what I would like is a buddy cop show in, in duplicate, right? That we get a Daughters of the Dragon show for half the time and we get Danny and Ward for the other half of the time. And those two pairings are awesome. Also, I'm sure that this would get us hate if it's listened to, but Ward Misty is my relation that's that's what i ship man ward and misty would be so good because he's actually someone who's smart enough and capable enough to deserve misty unlike danny but anyways well no but i'm telling you I, like i when i rewatched like the ward and misty meeting i was like oh my god the electricity but then when you watch all of the ward scenes like everybody he's introduced to that guy tom to Tom Palfrey, the chemistry that he has with every single person that he shares a scene with. And it doesn't make sense to me. I don't want to like him. I I don't want to. There's something weird about the way he talks. He looks weird. I generally don't like Joy. I like scenes with Joy if Palfrey's in the scene. You know, like, their sibling dynamic works for me, too. Yeah. So, Rhiannon, are you on this Ward um, bandwagon of ours? Yeah. No, I like... I mean, I've always liked Ward. I haven't been anti-Ward. I just... I mean, like, that's the thing is, like, I I don't want to like Ward. Because I know real-life people like Ward. And they're... (laughs) And they get... That's kind of the idea. (laughs) And they get... I mean, but that's the thing. I mean, he is a jerk. He is somebody that'll do anything to get ahead. He is a person that's buying his way into places. I do not want to like him. And then he's so darn likable. And this is what's wrong with America. <laughs> I'm just like... I love the idea that they're a perfect pair because Danny has the, the strength and the power to like muscle his way out of something if he has to and Ward doesn't. But there are going to be moments, if you write it correctly, where Danny would get himself in so much trouble and Ward is going to walk in and whether it be throwing some cash around or it's just going to be smooth talking, like Ward is the brain that Danny's brawn needs. And so the idea that they would work together and they really have built their chemistry. I mean, if you remember... That first episode, they talked about the ways that, like, Ward would, like, torture Danny as a little kid. And to believe that they have earned over 23 episodes that these two look like real friends. And I think they've done it partially by showing how the Davos Brotherhood went downhill. And, I mean, this is the... uh, I could talk about this all day. The, The way that they have made Ward someone you love and Davos someone you hate shows how well written the second season was because back when they were first introduced, it was quite the opposite. Remember how dashing and, you know, um, just charismatic Davos seemed early on. And it seemed fun to see Davos and Danny back to back at, you know, hand university. And anyway, I just feel like they've written it very well and transitioned it and a movie or a movie, a season of Danny and Ward backpacking across 
Asia going on like Indiana Jones type adventures to find other lost cities and to learn about chi powers and figure out how to do the gunslinger thing. Like that has me so sold. That is a show that I want desperately. And I just think they've done so well to get it there. Do you think we could get that show? I mean, is that even like something? I mean, do you think Netflix really would break up and have the Danny Ward show and give Dardos of the Dragon Daughters of the Dragon when they wouldn't aim towards... I just can't imagine them doing that when they haven't done Heroes for Hire. Because, I mean, I don't know. Am I... The, I feel like they completely are like, no, we are not doing Heroes for Hire. Like, Luke is over here somewhat gangsta. Misty's worried about him. You know, Kingpin of Harlem. And Danny is often wherever he is with his glow guns. Yeah, I... I think it's possible that season three of Luke Cage is the Daughters of the Dragon show. The whole season will be Ooh. Misty and Colleen trying to take down okay. Luke. Okay. I'm, I'm here for that. I think my biggest concern is the show that I want to see with Danny and Ward and the, you know, fist pistols and all that kind of stuff and them exploring all the, like, mysticism and everything. I I'm concerned that Netflix will not give them enough budget for it. Like that's, that's the real concern to me. The reason we haven't got Shao Lao is because there's not enough money for it. And I, I do worry that the show I want to see take place in Iron Fist season three, just they're not going to financially make possible. Do you have any of those concerns, Adam? I, I'm not sure. Um, I mean, budget wise, Netflix has been, you know, shelling out major money, um, to properties. So I don't know if, if they think there's, there's going to be, you know, a return on the investment. I don't see why they wouldn't give, uh, Iron Fist the budget it needs to be. I mean, look at Lost in Space, which is a huge, you know, space opera, you know, um, I don't know. You know, it comes down to, to where they go, you know, if God, God help us if season three goes back to Chinatown gang wars, you know, I mean, I, I think they're heading in the right direction. And if um, it's on Twitter, stop trying to cause a revolt, you know, maybe they'll throw more money at season three. Um yeah, I don't, I don't know. I guess I'm not worried. Um, I'm not sure what, I guess I don't know what the arrangement between Netflix and Marvel is, you know. Netflix does spend money on series, so I'm not sure if, you know, Marvel would be setting a cap and saying don't spend, I, you know, I don't know whose money's in play, I guess. At this point, I'm not worried. I mean, of course, we have to get a season three first, and I would guess that's almost a for sure at this point. It does seem to me, and this is just my guesswork, because, you know, this contract was put in place in, what, 2014 or something? The original Netflix Marvel contract? Um, I sometimes fear that, or even 2013, I, I fear sometimes that there's been an inflation of what Netflix will pay for new shows, but that they look at it and they because there's precedent of, oh, we made this show for X amount of dollars this time. Well, then the next season should only be X plus 10% or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Like that they've almost like grandfathered them in at a lower budget number on these Netflix shows because that's started so long ago, but maybe that's not right. It's just a fear that I have with those shows. Are you guys upset that the uh, transference of the dragon powers was through a magical bowl? I think that's actually part of it in the comment. I think in like one of the very earliest issues, Davos kind of performs a ceremony that's the same way. Oh, okay. So that's comic accurate. But also, it's magic. Magic is not explainable by scientific principle and if it is it ceases to be magic and so the idea that you get some weird arcane elements and you throw them in one place and it works 
to me, that's the way magic always works. Like, um, you know, an old witch's brew where, you know, you had like the old witch over like cackling, like we'll put in a rabbit's foot and the blood of a virgin and this and this, you know, and then it makes a potion. That doesn't make any sense. Why should it work that you do a little bit of his blood and a little bit of tattoo brand and then put it in a thing and make green smoke and then tattoo artists and then all of a sudden the powers transfer by putting your finger on their head? I don't know. It's magic. Magic is supposed to be weird and mystical. So I'm cool with that. I don't know, but punching a dragon in the heart seemed pretty straightforward. Like just a very straightforward. You do this, you get the brand of the dragon where you touch him. Boom. Boom boom, now you're the Iron Fist. Like, some witches decide to brew up a whatever in a special magical pot. I, I, I don't know. This is why we disagreed on the uh, the resurrection Look, coffins. Look, there's lines. For, for there's Double lines. Season two last week. <laughs> I was about to say. I was about to say it's one of those situations again with, I will believe that there's a man with glowing fists that's punched a dragon and all this, but man, when you take it to the point that there's a magic bowl and it'll light up your fingers, that's just where I draw the line. No. And I think I said last week, I am de- I've been deeply formed on this by the whole midichlorian force thing in Star Wars, where in the first trilogy, people just had the force. And then in the tr- the prequels, they decided to explain that there's some microbiology thing called midichlorians that make people more capable of dealing with the Force. It ruined it. It was good when you just had the Force. No one knows why you have the Force. You just have it. And then they had to go and do something dumb to explain it. And so since then, I have swore that I will always accept things on face value rather than run the risk of getting midichlorians again. So... But you did say something about comic accurate. Let's talk about that real quick. Uh, That's kind of our main discussion for today. Um, You know, there was been discussed this. I mean, where we kind of kicked off, you know, Adam has been getting in Twitter fights this week. And during my investigation of that deep rabbit hole, uh, I did see a tweet that said the show was stupid. It ended this way, the way it should have ended. And there was like a couple of panels of a comic book from the 1970s. And there is that criticism sometimes in these movies of, oh, you should have just did what the comic books did. Um, as you guys watch these Marvel properties, how important is it to you that you see something that is faithful to the comics? And what does that mean to you? I think when it comes to being faithful to the comics, it's about the characterization you know is is that character i think the comic gives great inspiration there's all kinds of stuff in them but if they you know any book adaptation any adaptation of an intellectual property is going to get changed it's going to get um moved around a little and it can still be interesting i mean i I love The Stand. I've read the book. I've watched the miniseries. In the miniseries, you know exactly what's going to happen. And it is still interesting to watch that, even though you know what's going to happen. But I think what's more important is that each character acts the way you expect them to act. You know, that if the, if these characters are brought in, that they're interacting and you get that same. And I think changing changing the environment isn't a big deal. Changing the character's innermost personality is, which I don't feel like Marvel has changed. Well, and I mean, like, Marvel's lucky with their stuff because, like, in the comic books, their personalities change. You know, like, you read... A silver era Daredevil, and you read a Wade era Daredevil, and then you read Charles Soule right now. These are not the same character. So in the comics themselves, there's no consistency in all of that, which I think is why they've been so successful, all of the comic characters in television. But uh, yeah, I, I don't feel like they need to have the exact story. Twitter, man. You you look at, at the these dudes and dudettes tweeting it, and you have the them pissed off that they took away Danny Rand's powers. It, it, what, 
at what point do you get so upset that you need to start a movement about over this damn fictitious TV show that took up a max of 10 hours of your life? You know, not even half a day. You get that upset over this kind of stuff? I, I, for the most part, I mean, I think uh, Davos steals the iron, first steals Danny's powers in Marvel premiere number 19. I believe that was Colin Wing's first appearance. Um, Danny Rand's first appearance, in, in contrast, was Marvel premiere number 15. So there had only been three issues. Four issues before Davos took Danny's power in the comics, and they're upset that they took it away in in the TV show. That's what I, I guess I I don't understand where they're coming from. Um, that they're upset that they're not treating Danny Rand right. Um, it, it just bewilders me. I mean, he's taken his he's gotten his powers taken away before. Uh, Colleen Wing uses her chi in, in mi- not mysterious ways, in various ways in the comics. Um, the Pirate Queen, that's in the comics. Orson Randall's chi bullets is in the comics. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, we're arguing over fictitious characters. You know, I, I saw it, people getting in the comments on on Facebook pages about Michael B. Jordan being in the running for the new Superman role. I mean, that's the thing. We're arguing over a fictitious character. I And maybe, maybe Danny Rand has had a huge impact on someone's life. I, I don't know. There's, there's all, all sorts of fan, uh, about every every comic character, but I, I don't think this these tweets and this hate, if we can call it hate, I, I really can't see how how it's warranted. I mean, in terms of comic accuracy, the only thing not comic accurate about this season is Danny and Misty weren't together. I think. I mean, what other things? Weren't uh, and Colleen Colleen getting the fist, but but she's happened. manipulated her chi before. I mean, uh, and maybe that's that right, that's right, something right. with it. I mean, for Christ's sakes, in in the Immortal Iron Fist run, there's seven cities that make up heaven, and each city has their own immortal weapon, and each immortal's weapons powers are to focus their chi into other forms. So are we? I mean. I guess what makes the Iron Fist the Iron Fist? You know, obviously, I think the Iron Fist is more of the Iron Fist is the person who actually kills Shao Lao. But why is why is Davos's fist red? Why is Colleen's fist and sword white? You know, maybe that's not the Iron Fist per se, and that's just them manipulating their chi through this process. Or something, or it really helps people who are watching make sense of who's who in right. a dark yeah, scene, I, right? You know, <laughs> you know, like I mean, I, I don't, I don't understand it, man. I don't understand why they're they're so upset about this being comic accurate when it's it was pretty damn comic accurate. I mean, Raven Metzner is a huge nerd. Look at the dude's Twitter. He's buying comics left and right. He's throwing out collecting verbiage. I mean, he he's a fan. He's a comic book collector and I don't get it. I mean, he, there I don't think there's been a showrunner in Marvel television that's been as much of a comic book fan and reader as what they had in Iron Fist and it's just be they're they're pissed off that I, I don't know, man. I don't understand it. Yeah, I mean, I have two immediate thoughts about, like, the idea of, like, canon and keeping accuracy. I felt a lot better about Divergence when I listened to Brian K. Vaughn talk about Runaways. Like, there were some there were some questions about some of the things they changed when they adapted Runaways for TV. And then Vaughn said, you know, we're actually doing some of the stuff I wanted to do when I wrote the comic, but... 
I did. I wasn't able to. You know, like we've talked about before on the show, he didn't know how long that comic would run, and so there's certain sh- stories that he didn't tell because he didn't think he'd have time to before he got canceled. And so now that he's making the TV show, he goes, "Yeah, I'm putting in some stuff that I've always wanted to do." Well, okay, there's the example of a comic book writer, a very good comic book writer, who doesn't treat what he did as like this very precious, perfect thing that was totally done right the first time. He's saying, I did it, I'm proud of it, but I want to try something else. And when he develops Why the Last Man, I bet they're going to do some things that are different and they're going to rearrange some stuff because it's different medium and he is a guy who runs... You know, Vaughn now works in TV and has been a comic writer and continues to write comics. I think it's meaningful that he realizes those are different and hearing a creator verbalize, yeah, I do that and that's okay, is great. My second thing is I want to be surprised. I've heard this phrase, well, it's a disservice to the fans. No, a disservice to the fans is a paint-by-number plot that you've already seen so that every stinking scene is what you already know. Like, when I'm watching Infinity War, there's that moment where Thanos looks at Thor and he goes, you should have aimed for the head. And he snaps. And I audibly gasped, right? Like, I did not know if that moment was going to come or not. Because I know that Marvel doesn't always do what the comics do. And they're trying to be faithful, but... I thought there'd be a snap, but maybe not. And in that moment, I had no idea if Thor would successfully kill Thanos or not. That's great. I want to have that experience. If they had done shot for shot rework of Infinity Gauntlet, I know how it ends. I know what happened. I've already read it. And so to me, they would have robbed me of the experience I had in the theater if they had done like page for page copy of the plot. And so I, I just... That part I don't understand. The idea of like, I want something boring and predictable just doesn't do it for me. I never really understand that that desire. You pretty much said it. I'm trying to put my thoughts into words that aren't just all expletives and old grouchy man (laughs) words. Well, so let's play. I mean, we can play devil's advocate for a minute. Is there a change, though, that you've ever seen in a Marvel show or TV movie or TV show? that did make you irate like a change that just so worked you up that you were guilty of the things that we were been complaining about here as far as not appreciating that they're added to- uh not giving us a gd dragon how about that i mean is that <laughs> that's kind of in the same boat a little bit how about runaways not running away i that i really yeah runaways i mean Caleb, you played the little devil's advocate on that, like, you know, Brian K. Vaughn and what he wanted and all that, but it was completely, to me, it wasn't just, oh, they changed the story because they didn't know why. To me, it took away the essence of what made the story great. Because what I loved about Runaways was that the children discovered their powers and worked it out between themselves. They solved problems on their own it was like the power of these teenagers like like children makes them sound really young but it the powers of these kids coming together without their parents explaining it to them they changed the essence of it like i don't care that it wasn't line by line the same as the stories i cared that it changed the essence of the story for me, I think that's just a contraction thing. I think by the time we get season two, it's going to get back to there. And I think what they did is they just made like two issues of the comic book an entire season long. If they just want to do straight comic book adaptations, there's no need to hire a writer's room, is there? <laughs> right, right. You could just pull out the comic and show it to the cinematographer and be like, oh, here we go. So it's not a, even a movie or film thing. I do I have to admit that when they made Cap Hydra in the Secret Empire stuff in the comics I got there may have been some angry tweets there. I may have uh canceled my Marvel Unlimited really over that. Marvel did you really? To let Marvel Oh, I did. I was so mad. Cuz like No, I'm with you. I mean, it made me mad too. I don't but... know. I now I've read it and now I kind of get where they were going and I'm 
I'm uh, I'm okay with it now. Okay, but uh, when it first happened, part of it was because so many of those creators were Jewish people. So the idea of like this character created by some American Jewish individuals turning into a Nazi was just it, that was too far. At the same time that uh, Nazism was rising in our country, you know, like that's that was a little bothersome. But at the same point, in the end, I saw that that storyline was meant to speak very politically to the world that we're living in and what's going on, right? And so I kind of you haven't read it. you mu- you ha- coat stuff hasn't hit. Tana, t- how do you say it? Tanahisi, Tana. Ta-Nehisi, Coates, yeah. I mean, his, no, I've not gotten to read this stuff. going to make you totally forgive all that. It's brilliant stuff. Also, we're talking about comic stuff that made us angry. We don't have to. That's I, I just I wanted to be fair. That's one where I lost my stuff. Um, you know what? Comic stuff makes me angry is the fifth. Wait, wait, wait! Before you say that, you're going to be so jealous because Bendis is coming to Comic Con. Oh, cool! To New York awesome. Comic Con for sure. Not sure. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> Good for him. Um, the one thing that pisses me off about comics is uh, five new Wolverine titles and five new Deadpool titles and five new Spider-Man titles each week. But that's nothing with our topic. That's just me ranting about <laughs> the <laughs> that bothers me. And now I actually have a lawn. I can yell at children to get off. Uh, so let me ask this. We're talking about adaptations and film and stuff. Um, at this point, do you find that you still feel more true to the comic books when there's a, a, a division or if the, not that you're upset that they changed something, but which version of the characters is dearer to your heart, the comic book versions or the movie and TV? Version? That's a really, really good question. I mean, take Iron Fist an example. I mean, I have, I've finally completed my iron fist collection so i own every single iron fist comic book ever and that's not even a fraction of what other characters are you know iron fist just doesn't have that that mythos like we've discussed you know earlier i mean for the most part all of danny rand's comics up until immortal iron fist were some sort of rehash of his origin. You know, you had Marvel premiere, which was his true origin. Then you had Iron Fist by John Byrne, and that was essentially the same thing. And then you had some mini runs in the 90s. And to me, there's just no mythos there, and he's not really a super, super deep character to begin with. Uh, You know, there's some instances, say they eventually do bring... Mark Spector into the movie or TV and if they don't like even touch on his mental illness and they just make him like a Punisher you know then that's that's something where I'm like okay you know you should probably go comic accurate with that you know it depends on the character I mean you have some characters where um, they were introduced in the comics after they were introduced on on the screen like uh, I mean uh, Coulson and I believe Fitz and Simmons are both comic characters now um yeah i I would guess it depends on the character you know obviously i am going to kind of be more attached to a clark greg colson than uh brian michael bendis written colson you know rhiannon what about you like which what daredevil is dearer to your heart charlie cox or the comics i don't I mean to me they're all the same character like Charlie Cox has embodied the character as much I mean I get just as weird about I mean when Charles Soule took over and the art changed to like very dark and or even like the new artist on the run and I don't remember who it is um that just took over a few issues ago the art's very different and it's it looks different and I mean you know Charlie Cox isn't a redhead isn't so visually and looking, you're used to the characters changing a lot, but the personality, the decision making, it stays somewhat consistent, you know, over like a decade or so. Um, and to me, they're the same character. Like it's a different universe. Yeah, you know, it's like a variant comic. 
where he's in the MCU rather than in the 616. But, you know, even when you go to the 1612, did I get the year right? The 1612 comic? That's still Matt Murdock. It's just a slightly different... I mean, it, I don't know. Like, I go with the flow. Whatever. It doesn't bother me. I don't... I don't get, they're all the same. They're all Matt Murdock. But Matt Murdock is dead. Yeah. I, I'm i enough of a... I don't know. I like movies and TV shows. I like moving pictures. Maybe I'm a simpleton. I just like shiny things. And so, like, I find over time the movie TV versions become a little more solid for me i also like that the canon is still um it's still digestible right like if you want to be a cap a captain america fan there are so many years of captain america comics i could never read them all if i try like i just run out of time whereas i i can see every single scene that has cap in it in the mcu and so i like that those characters are more digestible and I also think the characters are more pointed and like firm. Like the Robert Downey Jr. Iron Man is a very specific thing. And if you read 40 years of Iron Man comics, he's been lots of things. And you kind of say, which is which? I mean, for that matter, with Iron Fist, I'm not a huge Iron Fist reader. Um, you know, I read Immortal Iron Fist, and he's more of a taciturn, almost Batman y kind of character, I feel like. And then I read. Um, uh, Power Man and Iron Fist uh, that you know series where they were teamed up for a while and he was like Spider-Man cracking jokes and I really it kind of bothered me like I'm like which one of these characters is the character I think I like both of them better than I like Finn Jones Danny Rand but at least Finn Jones Danny Rand is a thing instead of being multiple things and so I guess that's where I tend to like the TV and film a little bit better so well, now they're getting smart and they're actually drawing the characters after their live action counterparts. Hashtag marketing. I mean, they just introduced the Tessa Thompson Valkyrie, and I mean, they've drastically altered heroes' looks upon their movie release and such. And I mean, we could, this conversation could go forever. I mean, Guardians of the Galaxy is a great example. Guardians of the Galaxy is so different than any other iteration of it, the movie. And it's so much better, I think, than most any other iteration. I mean, I don't know. Maybe there's some some lovers of the, you know, 70s or 80s Guardians that would feel differently. But, uh, you know, there's some times where I feel like the movies and screenwriters actually do something more interesting than what the comic books have done. And I think that's okay because comic books are supposed to, you know, Rhiannon, you said this. They're supposed to be living, moving, changing entities. And the second that they get stale and stay in the same place, nobody's going to read them anymore. So, I am amazed at how comics reinvent themselves and go to new places, yet hold on to the essence of the characters. And it is, it's something different. You know, like, I've been reading a couple of more indie-ish comics lately, just because. And... It's it's different when you pick up a series where a guy goes, oh, I'm going to write 40 issues of this and then it's going to be done. Like, it it is more consistent, but it also doesn't, like, I don't know. This I still, I love the big stuff. Like, I still love Spider-Man more than I'm ever going to love, like, a miniseries because it keeps going. Like, the stories keep coming, so... So you're getting into indie comics, right? This is a quick sidebar, and you're a pretty big Brian K. Vaughn fan. Have you read Saga yet? So I'm I'm doing Y first because they're working on okay. the, the FX show for Why the Last Man, mm-hmm. and so I'm about mm-hmm. halfway through. I'm like two and a half of the five volumes through it. So I'm doing that first, and then I'm gonna hit Saga next. And those, I mean. Pfft, I'm I'm not an indie guy. Those aren't even indie. That's Vertigo and Image, you know, but um yeah. Well, it's it's a good time. I mean, Saga's on hiatus for 12 months now. So you have time to get caught up, but you are you like I mean, it's only a matter of time before that comes becomes a huge movie or something, I'd say. You know, one of my favorites. This was oh, this maybe even predated my Marvel. Uh Bone by Jeff Smith is one of my favorite comics. I love bone. Um, 
I I've read it through with her oldest daughter. I'm about to do <laughs> it with the second. Um, the way it mixes like childlike humor with like Lord of the Rings kind of like fantasy, like that is a great comic book, and it's super thick. But if you want to read something really good, really funny, um, yeah, Bone, the one volume of Bone, like the one volume edition, it's the way to go, man. Stupid, stupid rat creatures. It's hilarious. It's so good. All right. Let's uh, wrap up and do the mailbag. Because I did the two different recordings, I have no idea how long this episode's gone. So, um, over on the YouTube channel, uh, Indie Film something, I forget his exact handle name, uh, had just uh, mentioned that Colpack has been on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. since the beginning. And... Uh, uh, indie film productions. Mark Kolpak's great. He's been head of visual effects since the pilot, and I'm so glad he's finally getting a chance to direct. I think we agree. Uh, Dave on the website just finished Iron Fish season two, and I think I agree with Adam. I'm excited for season three now. Um, along those lines, Adam, we didn't talk about the major comic illusion. I don't know if it should be an Easter egg. The comic illusion that you caught. That I feel like nobody's talking about on Iron Fist. Yeah, I don't know how anyone... It's the GD Baxter building. How are we not talking about this? That should have made headline news, and I haven't seen any site run for it. So technically, I think the Baxter building is technically located at 42-something else. Uh, but, I mean, there's enough there that makes you say, hmm. So this is, what, episode right? six, right? They go into they go into an abandoned building to fight Davos. And the outside of the building has, like, a picture of the construction project. And the building's called 42 Baxter, right? Yes, that's kind of where his, uh... Um... Davos's headquarters are right. That yeah. shady brick yeah. building. Oh, is it where the headquarters at the end is? Where he's got his little like hand university part two, or did he move to a different building? Yes. No. Yeah, I think that's all the same building. Okay. It's where the bulb was hidden, where Joy had her little free fall. Free fall. Spoilers for those that skipped. The now spoiler. I'm free. I thought that might be funny, but you guys are just looking disgusted, so. <laughs> Rest in peace, Tom. Um, he's rolling in his grave. <laughs> uh, so, but anyways, yeah, 42 Baxter, which I would, to me, it's more just like a, a wink, wink, nod, nod to the comics. Not a suggestion that that's the actual Baxter building, but. Well, just like Sam Chung. I mean... There was a character named Sam, maybe last name Chung, but there was no blind spot in this series. So, lots of little winks and nudges. But at least with Sam, they kind of left that in a spot where something definitely could happen. I mean, he helped them out quite a bit, and he seemed like the one good guy in that group, you know? He stayed alive, and he's Asian. So, sure... Yeah, he didn't. Look, but we, I mean, we don't know his backstory or anything. Yeah, he didn't look super. He didn't look very much like he's gonna be jumping off buildings. He seemed a little old, I think, is the concern. And plus, I think he he was yeah. only credited as Sam, at least the one episode I rewatched. That's good. Not my blind spot. Not my, not my blind. <laughs> I mean, the thing it, it reminds me a lot of. We had heard that Black Panther was gonna have a Tilda Johnson. That woman, the the girlfriend that Killmonger kills is supposed to be Tilda Johnson. Right. And I think that that was just trying to do a loving nod and wink to the comics. But it would be a total waste of that character, particularly since we got a much better and interest, more interesting situation with Tilda in Luke Cage Season 2. And so I would just continue to encourage Marvel, don't waste character names... You know, like, it, make it Just Sam so that you age. can use Blind Spot later. I still think that Madam Mask and Agent Carter Season 2 was a total waste of that character name. Like, there was nothing with about that character that you'd have to, like, make her named that. That was silly. And according to people on Twitter this week, Danny Rand is a complete waste of that character's name as well. 
Love Waffle on the... But... <laughs> No. I love the I love the last week we're all like we you can bash the property but don't bash the fans you know and all that and this week has been, the whole team has been Adam bashing the people that no tweeted. but they're not they're not fans of the property right I mean that's okay I mean it's not like we're making I mean I make fun of Shadowhunters fans but that's just kind of a random <laughs> joke. But these people are actively trying to dismantle something. True. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. I mean, I don't. Know. I'll say this: I don't want to get into fights like you do on Twitter. But um, I think M. Raven Metzner is that his name? Yeah. Uh, I think he deserves a ton of credit for what he did. Oh, for sure. I mean, this could get me hate mail. This reminds me of the first term of an Obama presidency, right? Obama gets elected. Okay. We're in two wars. We're in the middle of the Great Recession. Like the the plane is is heading quickly towards the ground. And his job that first four years was just to pull up and try to keep the thing from crashing. Mm-hmm. That's the situation M. Ratzner M. Ratzner, M. Raven Metzner walked <laughs> into. Like he walked into a show that Scott Buck had driven into the ground. And I think this whole season was him just stabilizing the thing. I'd love to see what he could do when he didn't start with a, you know, burning wreckage. Like, if he could start with something decent, like he's prepared for himself. And so I just think, I want to defend him because I think he's done an incredible job. So Definitely. Um, Love Waffle on the website. Uh, his big takeaway from the Captain Marvel preview is similar to mine. He thinks Jude Law is going to be the bad guy in the movie. Um, and that he's going to, you know, use the scroll invasion to be pretense for attacking earth. And maybe that's where him and Carol, uh, split, uh, split. Um, he, um, was also saying, uh, also there's a quote from Nicole Perlman in 2016, where she said they were going to change up Carol's origin because they thought it was too similar to green lantern. But in doing so, don't they just make her Star Lord, just half Kree instead of half Celestial? Um, and I thought, yeah, that's very interesting. But I had forgotten those comments about Green Lantern that they were trying to avoid any similarities to that property. So, well, we want to thank you guys for listening to the show. We really appreciate all the support we get for Marvel News Desk, the website, the YouTube, all that stuff. Um, thanks for listening. You can interact with us several ways. You can send us messages on Twitter at Marvel News Desk. Communicate with us via our MarvelNewsDesk.com post each week. If you want to support the show, we'd love for you to give us a dollar a month over at Patreon.com slash Marvel News Desk. That'll give you access to our annual uh, special episodes, including last year's MCU film ranking episode that is available only to Patreon supporters, uh, as well as get early access to videos like our gifted video that should come out sometime this week. Uh, like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Marvel News Desk or subscribe to the YouTube channel. That's watch.marvelnewsdesk.com. You can help the show be more visible to others if you leave us a five-star review on iTunes. We appreciate those. Number one thing you do every week is you listen and tell your friends. Please keep that up. Thanks to Tim Cox for our logo. You can find him on Instagram at Tim V. Cox. And thank you to Alvin for the theme music. You can find him on a variety of social media platforms at The Skull School. Um, I have no idea what we're talking about next week. I think we'll have a couple of kind of down weeks until uh, New York Comic Con. I just realized Comic Con and Venom are the same week. I almost feel like I know you did, but I just re realized it. I, I almost it feels like we should make that two different episodes, right? Definitely. Like, so the Venom review is going to get delayed. That's what I'm hearing. <laughs> uh, do we actually have to <laughs> review it? Yeah, we have to talk about it in some way. I went to the panel in San Diego. <laughs> I had to go to that stupid panel. Oh, uh, it is kind of interesting. It seems weird they're not doing anything at Comic Con, but it's anyway. kind of weird that they're making a Venom movie. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening to the show, guys. We'll talk to you later.